You want to train the machine learning model and you already know that you will need to use cross-validation. Great! So now which of the many variations should you use? In today's video, we will answer this question I will show you a foolproof way of selecting the right cross-validation methodology every time. First, let's define cross-validation. Cross-validation is a technique for assessing how the result of a statistical model will generalize to an independent dataset. The simplest form that fits this definition is to train on one portion of the data and test on the rest. However, the motion of holding out some part of the data can take many shapes. There are many variations that are possible and figuring which one to use can seem daunting. However, the simple trick that I'm going to show you make it very easy. The trick is to think about how your model will be used and interacting with data once deployed. This will direct how you should train and cross-validate your model. So generally there are three components during a given task when it's time to do a prediction in production. There is a data source, which generates the data from which the model needs to take as its input. The, there's the trained model per se, and then the output can be labels or regression numbers. So to illustrate here is an example in a medical setting. Given an unseen patient, collect information and samples to predict if they have the presence of a disease in one of their samples. The data source here is a new unseen patient. It's the thing that is generating the sample that the model will use as input. The model here is already all trained and doesn't know about this patient, but know about patients and diagnosis in general. Their trained model never saw this patient before. The label here is either the presence or the absence of a disease. To validate this model during training, the model cannot already have seen the patient in the training data for the model or reported performance to be valid. This important information will help us define how we'll cross-validate the model. So in this particular setup, what we need to do is train on a bunch of participants and test on another bunch of participants that are not in the training data. Let's see how this cross-validation trick holds out in four different scenarios. The first scenario is that you have lots and lots of data. In that case, it's usually best to simply use a holdout set. When you have loads and loads of data, any given sampling will look very similar. Sometimes it's not really the case because of high interdependency in time or with how the data was generated. But most of the time, if you have loads of data, most sampling will be pretty similar. And usually the reason for that is that you have a diverse and large amount of data generator producing this information that you're using for training. Let's look at an example to illustrate. So the task we're gonna check out here, giving a prompt from a human autocomplete the missing word. So the training data for this will come from a massive amount of internet pages, and these were generated by a large amount of human writing the words of all diverse kinds. And a good example here of dataset are Reddit and the common crawl dataset. So if we use our trick here about how the model will behave in production during testing, if we use the task of next word prediction, the data generator is human creating a prompt. The model is, in this case, GPT, and the output is simply the next word. And the only thing that matters in this particular case is if the model has seen enough data point. Even if they saw this specific phrase in the data set, it doesn't really matter. We just need to have enough of the data. So the main reason that it is fine to use all that with large amount of data is that both the training and test set will be so large that it will be equally representative of the data in general that the model will see in production. Now, you might not have lots of data every time for the common machine learning experiments. The first question you should ask yourself is, are my observation independent? What I mean is that the data is roughly independent and identically distributed. It's rarely the case though, but it, sometimes it's roughly good enough. The generator of the data here is generating one data point after the other, and there is no memory of the data previously generated. This is kind of what it means by independent and identically distributed. So in that case, if you have that, you should be using keyfold cross-validation and its variant to cross-validate if your model is doing good during training. The generation of observation that are independent kind of looks something like this. The data generator in red is spewing data points one after the other and isn't having any memory of any one particular data point. So all of them are kind of independent for each other, but they come from this data generator. One example task that could fit in this category is user reviews for a store like Amazon. So let's look at an example with the given task. Given a newly created product, predict whether its first review will be positive or negative. And that's it up. The data generators are the Amazon users, which create data points that are roughly independent and identically distributed. A single data point in this case will be a single review for a new product. So if we use our trick here, 
how would the model behave in the production? A new product will be created and the model will be able to predict the user feedback based on its attribute. Now the model was trained with the first user reviews of a new product. And here we assume that no one group of users is dominating the review process, meaning that there isn't a group of user that is constantly generating the first review in an independent manner. If we have a massive amount of data, all that will work just fine here to cross-validate the model during training phase. But if we don't, the setup is perfect for Keyfold as it will give us a proper estimate of what the model will look like in production. Keyfold is very simple. It will not take into consideration either the class or the group parameter of a data point. It will simply split the data into equally sized chunk and train on the training set and test on the testing set repeatedly. Since you don't have lots of data, this testing on multiple folds will give you a fair estimate of what will happen in production. Five to 10 folds are usually good enough. Now, there are variations on the vanilla keyfold cross-validation, like the stratified version. This one will try to keep the same percentage of sample for each of the target class across fold. So this variation is class aware, very useful for unbalanced data set. There are other variations which are a bit more data efficient, like shuffle split, where multiple split are sampled randomly with replacement. This is useful when you have very little data. Now, let's say the observation are not independent. The first question to ask yourself is, is there a time dependency at play during the data generation process? If yes, then you should use a time split. A visualization of a time-dependent data generator look like this. At time t equals zero, the generator create a data point. At time t equals one, the generator create another data point, but keep in mind the previous t equals zero data point. At the process, continue while keeping all the data from the previous generation in memory. A good example of data generated in this manner is stock data. The price of a stock today depends on many things, but one of the most important information is the price of the stock in the past. Let's look at an example with the given task here. Given previous information about the stock market, predict the next stock price of a given stock. For instance, the Apple stock data generator will look something like this. If you train with keyfold cross-validation that we saw previously, and you don't take time into consideration, your classifier will get an unfair advantage which will ha not happen in production. Namely, your model will have seen the future and the past before making a prediction on the current value of a stock, which is not possible. Let's use our model in production trick to illustrate this. Your model is deployed in production, and at time t equals zero, need to make a prediction based on historical data from the market. At t equal one, the model will need to make a prediction about the stock based on the history, which will include the previous result from t equals zero. At t equal two, it will continue again and again and again, never using data from the future to make a prediction of the data at the current time. The cross-validation scheme that best represents that setup is the time series split, which progressively take a walk through the data across each fold. Never the model know about the future to make a prediction about the present or the past. Now, maybe your observations are independent from each other, but not in the time domain. Maybe they are dependent from each other based on the grouping of the sources. In that case, you should make use of group fold. Visually, it looks something like this. Each data generator process is generating multiple data points. The data point generated by each process is a bit different than each other's. If we were to run a clustering algorithm on the raw data point, we'd be able to easily reconstruct which data belong to which generator. This way of generating the data is often what you will encounter in the medical field, like with this data set of emotion recognition based on EEG brain signal. The main reason for this is that each person generates a very specific EEG pattern, and it's very easy to fingerprint a specific person. Let's look at an example with the task given here. Given label EEG data about patient's emotional state, predict what an unseen patient emotional state will be. In that situation, you have participants that are each generating the various data point about the emotional state. Each participant EEG signal is a bit different, but you will be able to recognize each of them based on their patterns. So what our training model will look like in production? First, the participant that will provide the data is unseen by the model. Like in the very, very first example we saw, the model never saw this participant brain activity before. Then the model will use its general knowledge about the emotion state given EG signal to make a call on what is the state of the new participant across time. Group fold is great for this situation. The base version is like key fold, except it is group aware, meaning that it will take a defined number of groups in the training data and a defined number of groups in the testing data. Group in this case simply means each of the participants as their brain activity is easily recognizable per participant. And we don't want the model to rely on that to make a call because that's not what will happen in production. 
Depending on how much skewed your data is in a class, you can use stratified group keyfold, which will do its best to preserve the distribution of the different class across split while keeping the group data in mind. This is harder to accomplish and is more approximate than with the vanilla stratified keyfold. You get the same idea with the group shuffle split. Think about it as the same as their keyfold counterpart, but with the constraint on keeping the group together at all costs. So if we summarize, if you got lots of data, use holdout. If your observations are independent, use keyfold. If you have time dependency, use time split. And finally, if your data is generated via groups, use groupfold. In all case, don't forget the simple trick of thinking about how your model will be used in fully deploy setting to inform how you're going to validate it during training time. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like if it was the case and leave a comment if you have any question. I'm here to help. Have a great week, everyone, and see you in the next video.